Right, Wahoo for part two. So before I uh, read this chapter here, chapter four, the uh, anemometer metaphor, uh, I would like to uh, get the help of any uh, physics Nazis. <laughs> Sieg heil. Sieg heil. <laughs> Out there on this uh, on this chapter here because. Uh, Webster here, here, he claims that the theory heating data, which was relying on the uh, special relativity model at the time, he claims here, there, that uh, see here, the fact that the special relativity changed from an imaginary time to an actual time, but failed to make the transition from imaginary cause to an actual cause. Mr. Uh, Webster here is saying that was the special relativity used at the time, which is still being used now. It appears here that he is saying, if I understand this correctly, that this is the model of special relativity which is being used today, and that uh, it fails to make the transition from an imaginary cause to an actual cause. And uh, that's what he's going to explain in this chapter here. So, buckle up, get into a good position, and uh, uh, let's read this chapter. So, here we go. Chapter 4, the Animometer Metaphor. <clears throat> that which is looked upon by one generation as the apex of human knowledge is often considered as an absurdity by the next, and that which is regarded as a superstition in one century may form the basis of science for the following one. Paracelsus 1493 to 1541. Introduction. As mentioned in chapter 1, the version of special relativity that helium heating used in their famous 1971 experiment is vastly different from that of the uh, 1905 version. At the end of this chapter, the difference between the original special relativity and the current or new special relativity will be clearly observed. But in order to accomplish that, it is critical that a metaphor be used to set stage and establish important realization concepts and terminology. This metaphor will be the bridge between the special relativity of 1905 and the new special relativity currently being used in physics. So we'll go up to here and... Uh, so I hope you understand what my question was <coughs> that relates to these two. Yeah, all the physics, special relativity, and special relativity model. Uh, it will also aid immensely in an understanding of the Hathili heating discussion in the next chapter. So, once again, the real purpose of this chapter, however, is that I want to make it perfect. Yeah. That there must be a cause of the Hathili heating data. The fact that the special relativity changed from an imaginary time to an actual time, but failed to make the transition from an imaginary cause to an actual cause, must be clearly understood. This chapter will make it clear. <clears throat> the, uh, the anemometer metaphor. An anemometer is an object commonly used by meteorologists or weathermen to measure the speed or velocity of the wind. It consists of several cups that is hollow hemispheres or hollow cones placed on rods that are attached perpendicularly to a vertical pole. The anemometer spins around as a function of the velocity of the wind, that is, if the wind moves faster, the anemometer spins faster. Now consider an automobile that has a long pole vertically attached to its roof, and on top of this pole is an anemometer. Assuming there is no wind, suppose the automobile is driven across a large parking lot at 80 kbh, that is kilometers per hour. Now, two teams of physics students, team A and team B, observe that as the car increases in velocity to its cruising speed, the anemometer spins even faster and faster. Once the car reaches its cruising speed, they observe that the anemometer spins at a constant rate. Note that the weather, the car, note that whether the car is standing still and there is an 80 km per hour wind or whether there is no wind and the car is moving at 80 km per hour, the anemometer will still spin at exactly the same rate. Normally, anemometers are attached to buildings and thus they measure the velocity of the wind. But in this case, it is assumed that there is no wind but the anemometer is moving, that is the car it is attached to is moving. <coughs> Let us assume that two sets of physics students, team A and team B, are given the task of figuring out why, that is the cause, the anemometer turns and to derive a formula to predict its spin velocity at different speeds of the car. Let us assume that the students in team A have not yet been taught about the uh, small particles, that is uh, air and wind, and that they calculate the increase in speed on the basis of the relative velocity of the two coordinate systems. A coordinate system can be thought of as uh, any object that has measurable motion, even if that motion is zero kilometers per hour. For example, the car or the animal will represent one coordinate system, and an observer standing on the pavement will represent the second coordinate system. In this case, the car accelerates at 80 kilometers per hour, but the observer is standing still on the pavement and thus is traveling at zero kilometers per hour. When the car has reached its cruising speed of 80 kilometers per hour, the relative velocity of the two coordinate systems is 80 kilometers per hour. Because the car is traveling at 80 kilometers per hour, the observer is uh, traveling at zero kilometers per hour. To obtain the relative velocities, it is simply necessary to subtract the velocities of the two coordinate systems in this simple example, 80 kilometers per hour, minus zero kilometers per hour equals 80 kilometers per hour. Note that the relative velocity is actually the speed of the car, since one of the coordinate systems is not moving and is always zero kilometers per hour. Team B, on the other hand, believes that small particles called air are causing a resistance to the cups. They had observed that if they stuck their hand out the window of the car when it was traveling at 80 kilometers per hour, there is some invisible force that pushes against their hand much more strongly than if the car was traveling at 10 kilometers per hour. They concluded that the same force that pushes against their hand was the same force pushing against the animal cups. 
10B derives their formulas based on resistance to predict the spin velocity of the ammotor, meaning based on velocity of the ammotor to its ambient air stream. Thus, team A based on their formulas on the relative velocity of the anemometer and the observer, but team B based their formulas on the velocity of the anemometer and the ambient air or wind that surrounds it, that is the ambient velocity. <coughs> Both team A and team B derive exactly the same formulas. This is because in the case of team A, the observer is stationary, but the velocity of the car is also the relative velocity of the car and the observer. Furthermore, there is no wind. Also in the case of team B, since there is no wind, the velocity of the car is also the relative velocity of the car and the air. Thus, both teams generate exactly the same formulas. Those experiments. Because team A and team B have the same formulas, but not the same theories as to why the animal spins, two experiments are set up. In the first experiment, the observer of team A runs behind the car at a speed of 15 kilometers per hour, and the car and wind act exactly as before. Namely, the car accelerates from 0 kilometers per hour to 80 kilometers per hour, and there is no wind. In this experiment, it is noted that when the car reaches 80 kilometers per hour, the relative velocity of the car and the observer is 65 kilometers per hour, because the observer is running at 15 kilometers per hour behind the car. However, it is noted that the animal spins at exactly the same velocity as it did in the original experiment. Thus, team A derives the wrong formula, but team B continues to derive the correct formula. Team A thinks they have the answer to the fact that their formulas don't work. They claim that their formulas are based on the apparent or relative perspective of the observer. They claim that because the observer is running, he thought, thought that the animal is rotating at a velocity based on 65 kilometers per hour speed of the car. In other words, they claim that the animal since they claim that the observer, in other words, they claim that the observer, since he would be in motion, observes the spin velocity of the animal differently than he would if he were at rest. Meaning standing still on the pavement and moving at zero kilometers per hour. Under this assumption, the formulas of team A work. The leader of team B <coughs> asks the question, suppose there are two observers, one standing still on the pavement and one running behind the car at 15 kilometers per hour. Then how fast is the animal rotating? Team A answers that the at rest observer will see the animal rotating at an 80 kilometers per hour spin velocity and that the running observer will simultaneously see the animal rotating at a 65 kilometers per hour spin velocity. Thus, team A thinks they have proven that here doesn't exist. Second experiment. Now a second experiment is designed. This experiment, everyone waits until the wind is blowing at exactly 15 kilometers per hour in the same direction the car will be headed. At this point, the car is accelerating exactly as it originally did, and the observer is stationary. In this case, the ambient velocity of the wind and the anemometer becomes 65 kilometers per hour. However, the relative velocity of the observer, who is standing still in this experiment, and the car is 80 kilometers per hour. In this case, the anemometer is actually spinning more slowly than it did in the original experiment. Because the observer is not running, in this case, the formulas of team A do not work. That is, they do not correctly predict the spin velocity of the anemometer because they predict the spin velocity based on 80 kilometers per hour. The formulas of team B do work when the wind is moving at 15 kilometers per hour in the same direction as the car. Remember, team B is comparing the anemometer to the ambient velocity of the wind that surrounds it. Team A has no answer for their failures in this case because they do not believe in air. And to adjust their formulas for wind would be to admit that air exists. Formulas versus theories. One of the most common errors made in physics is not thinking independently about a formula or raw data in theory. Note that the formulas of team A are valid if there is no wind and the observer is stationary and can be verified by anyone. The data that leads to the, to the formulas ditto is also verifiable and, noted and is also verifiable and replicable. However, the theories of team A are false, even though their formulas are correct, and therefore their formulas at times do not work, and at other times team A has to give some strange paradoxical explanations to justify their results. Their theories are that it is the relative motion of the observer and anemometer that causes the anemometer to rotate. But in fact, it is the relationship between the ambient air and the animal that causes the animal to rotate. In fact, the person could argue that team A doesn't even have a theory, since they make no explanation for the cause of why it is the relative difference between the observer and the animal that causes the animal to rotate. More will be said about this in a future chapter. What it takes for team A to look good. Now let us take this example a little further. How can team A get their formulas to work in every case and thus have a chance and thus have a chance of always being right? Ponder that question before moving on. The answer is for team A to require that the observer is always standing still and that there will be no wind during the contest. Thus they will always thus they will allow one observer coordinate system, one that is not moving and is always at rest, meaning they're standing still, and they will require that there be no wind. In this case, their formulas will always work. There is another way to look at this. Team A must make sure the observer is moving in the correct direction and velocity relative to the anemometer when they build their mathematical model. In other words, they must pick the correct at rest motion of the observer. In this case, the correct direction and velocity is 0 kilometers per hour, of course, assuming no wind. But suppose they had incorrectly concluded that the correct direction and velocity for the observer was to run behind the car at 15 kilometers per hour because on the day they made this calculation, there happens to be a 15 kilometers per hour wind moving in the same direction as the car. They would have picked the wrong at rest motion of the observer, and their formulas would not have worked on days when the wind was not moving or was moving at a different speed or in a different direction. In summary, with the right restrictions, no wind, and the correct choice of the at rest reference frame, team A will always get the right answer for their formulas, even though their theory is totally wrong. There are several things to learn from the unlocked metaphor. The formulas of team A can be perfectly valid, but their theories can be totally false. This is the third a formula or data and a theory. Team A's formulas are dependent on choosing the correct direction and velocity of the observer, and that there is no wind. Team A offers no physical cause as to why the cuts rotate. They only offer a formula that works if the correct direction and velocity of the observer is used and there is no wind. Note that if the direction and velocity of the observer changes as he starts running when he is supposed to be standing still, it will have no effect on the spin velocity of the anemometer. Since the formulas of Team A involve the relative 
velocity of the anemometer and the observer. The observer is part of the formula. That is a factor that must be in the formula for the direction and velocity of the observer in order to calculate the relative velocity of the two coordinate systems. Because the observer is part of the formula, it is only natural and logical <coughs> that the observer would have some effect on the spin velocity of the anemometer. <coughs> In other words, because the observer's direction and velocity are built into the formulas of Team A, then the observer's direction and velocity should affect the actual spin velocity of the anemometer. Or put it in yet another way, since the direction and velocity of the observer is part of the formula, if the observer changes direction and velocity, the rotation velocity of the anemometer should change. But it doesn't. So why is the observer's direction and velocity part of the formula? Based on this first chapter, the reader should already based on the first chapter, the reader should already see why the anemometer metaphor is so similar to the special relativity. However, there is much yet to be said about the special Relativity.